Well, welcome everybody. It's 12 o'clock, so I should probably start. We have another 20 participants with us virtually today. So it's the fun thing we've all learned through COVID and that way more people can enjoy the programs. So I'm Terry Emma. I am the executive director here at the Geneva History Museum. And it is my honor on this International Women's Day to do this program about Kate Raftery. And I'm also very honored to have family members of Kate's here with us. We have her great-granddaughter, Kate Raftery Muth. And then we have her um, granddaughter-in-law, I would assume, Mary Raftery. So, and they're, they're friends with them today. They drove in from Wisconsin just for this program. So we're thrilled and honored to be here. I'd love if you'd like to say anything when we're done. I don't know. Um, or mom, yeah, Mary, either one of you. And it's really thanks to them that we were able to gather more information about Kate. Um, in the archives downstairs, we did have some information, maybe two photographs of her. And of course, we could do some digging, but they were so gracious. I think it's probably been at least about five years ago, they came in with bins for us and they let us scan everything and I think we had it for a month or two and that way you'll see a lot of what we're showing today is because the rafteries were so generous to us so thank you appreciate it and I hope I do her justice <laughs> no pressure right <laughs> all right so I'm going to share my screen so those at home can enjoy what you're seeing here today All right, Marky, all look good? Thank you, okay. So Kate Raftery's name is well known in Geneva as the originator of The Little Traveler on South Third Street. But this program is going to explore the life of Kate Raftery outside The Little Traveler. We did a program last month just about the history of Little Traveler and that's totally different. But today I'm just gonna concentrate on Kate. Be a few mentions of Little Traveler, obviously. It wouldn't be a program without that, but um, this is really just about Kate. And I've really, I've grown to love this woman and uh, she is my inspiration. <laughs> so Kate Howard was born in Jeffersonville, Indiana in 1870 to Kate Lackey and Captain John Howard. She had one brother who became Dr. John Howard. Here's her father, Captain John Howard. One, he's one of the founders of the Howard Shipyards in Jeffersonville, Indiana, along with his brothers, James and Daniel. Captain Howard was a strict disciplinarian. He taught his children the principles and determination of life. And we do not have any pictures of Kate, uh, the wife. So I don't know if you guys have any. No. Among the fad, famous boats that were built under his supervision are the Robert E. Lee, the John C. Howard, and the Thompson Dean. And this is a postcard from the Howard Shipyard. It is a museum now. I guess you can go and, and visit it as a museum. Kate devoted herself to music and displayed talent at an early age. Her father purchased a Steinway grand piano for Kate's seventh birthday. That piano becomes famous in her Geneva home later in this story. The piano is still in the Raftery family, I believe right, uh, today. And this is a photo of it in the late 1950s with a nice sleepy lazy dog underneath. <laughs> the captain retires from the shipyards and sells his interest to his nephew, Captain Edward Howard. The family moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and the captain bought a controlling interest in French Lick Springs Resort in Indiana. That was something I did not know. And as I was reading some of Kate's letters, she goes to French Lick a lot, and now I know why. Kate adored her father. Among her fondest memories growing up were the trips with her father down the long Ohio River. They would race through the night, which stirred Kate's adventurous spirit. She was educated abroad by governesses and spent months touring Europe over the summers. And the paper would always cover it. The summer of 1892, Kate was 22 years old. During one of Kate's travels, she and her friend Annie Hargis, noted in this article as two popular Louisville society girls, nearly lost their lives by drowning at Lakewood Lake Chautauqua, New York. The girls along with Sam Churchill were boating and mm -hmm. Churchill stood up in the boat and began to rock it violently, finally capsizing the boat and throwing the girls into the water. 
Kate went under several times as a New York man tried to help. He saw her dress and caught it just in time. Her friend Annie had been buoyed up by her dress and she did not struggle and both girls survived. But how would, would things be different? So this is one of her many letters that we have um, transcribed here at the museum. I got very into her handwriting. At first I was like, oh my gosh. But after a while I started to understand her T's and her I's. And, um, this is an 1893, I'm sorry, in, in 1893, her mother dies and she, her mother's only 59 years old and Kate's just 23. That same month, it appears that Kate met her future at French Lick, a Mr. Edmund Raftery of London. Thanks to the Moulis family, the museum has letters Kate wrote to Edmund after their meeting. Kate was mourning her mother's death, but she and Edmund were developing a friendship that soon after blooms into love. In this letter dated July 26, 1893, Kate reminisces about the first time they meet and relays, when I asked you what I could do after I had broken through your eggshell, you answered, why can't a woman devote herself to her home? I asked you a negative question. You don't like women, Mr. Raftery? Now the astonishing part of your answer is that it didn't make me angry. This is what you said in your very pleasant voice. No, I don't care for women except to bandy a few words with them occasionally. Poor Mr. Raftery, I truly pity you. I shall expect more of you than to bandy an occasional word with me. <laughs> the letter writing goes back and forth and quite frequently with mentions of meeting up at French Lick or in Chicago where Edmund worked as a stove manufacturer. So she's really fun to read and try to get into her brain. On September 3rd, 1894, Kate and Edmund were married in Indiana. Kate's friend, Miss Annie Clay, acted as bride of honor and Edmund's twin brother, Alfred, was best man. After the simple ceremony, the couple left for Chicago. We have found through research and telephone directories that the Rafteries lived in Evanston, Illinois in 1895 at Oak and Grove Avenue. I tried on Google Earth to see what that is today and it doesn't look like a home. So I was hoping it might still be there, but it was totally different. The Geneva History Museum collection includes Kate's wedding coat that she may have worn on her trip to their Evanston home that night. The coat is silk taffeta with a wool lining and removable, removable velvet collar. It has three button side closure, gagot or leg of mutton sleeves. And the back was, um, black was a fashionable color in the 1890s. And Kate was known to wear monotone, mostly black or gray long coats. I'm kind of dressing like Kate today in her honor. It was said that Kate's clothes were designed by Edith Head, a Hollywood Academy Award winner. And that was mentioned by one of her, uh, one of her employees downstairs in an interview. So I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I thought that's pretty interesting. In 1895, Kate takes care of her brother's two children during his divorce and attends several court hearings. The children were ages two and three and Kate wasn't a mother yet herself. It was a very heated case between Kate and her brother and his wife. Kate has a nurse to help care for the children, but she's criticized in court for not having experience herself in being a mother. The courtroom was at capacity and Louisville, Kentucky newspapers covered every word. Sometimes it took up an entire page of the newspaper. The case goes on for over a month and the children are eventually taken in by their maternal grandmothers. In November of 1896, Kate and Edmund had a son, John Howard Raftery, and Edmund sent this telegraph to his brother-in-law in Louisville. Splendid boy arrived 10 this morning. Doctor reports everything normal with both. John Howard Raftery, known as Howard, was the only child of Edmund and Kate. Here he is. Isn't he a cutie? <laughs> Very similar to Kate's picture when we look side by side, we're like same eyes and kind of the same um, way that their hair is parted. As early as 1898, research indicates that the Rafteries moved to Aurora, Illinois. Directories list them living on Highland Avenue and they are quick to immerse themselves in the, in the community. And I do believe their home in Aurora still exists. I can't quite figure out which one it is, but if you Google Earth that, the, the, that address, it definitely looks like a home that the Rafferys would have lived in. It's quite grandiose. Uh, they get involved with the Aurora Golf Club where Edmund served as president. In 1903, one of the worst fires in Chicago's history killed more than 500 people in the Iroquois Theater fire. 
It was December 30th and the theater was filled with teachers, mothers and children enjoying their holiday break to see Mr. Bluebird in over the top musical comedy. Mary Holbrook Frazier took her 13 year old daughter, Helen to the theater that day. They were friends and neighbors of the Raftery's in Aurora. Mary's father was their pastor at their church for the Raftery's. The Frazier family was very prominent in Aurora. They were owners of large industry and the newspaper in Aurora and they were involved in local politics. Mary Frazier was missing after the fire, but her daughter Helen escaped without injury. Newspaper articles listed Reverend Holbrook, Mary's father, and Edmund Raftery as going into Chicago to look for Mary. Her jewelry and clothing were identified at the morgue, and her body was found and returned to Aurora for the funeral. And just a side note, I believe Mary Frazier, who dies here, is the aunt of Walter Frazier, who ends up coming to Geneva and forms an architecture firm with Howard Raftery. So there's a big tie with the Fraser family. So what, what does it have to do with Kate? Well, the Iroquois fire had a major impact as uh, Kate's going to reference here in this next letter. And I'm not really quite sure exactly what she means by some of this. She's writing this letter to her daughter-in-law. This is much later on in 1942. Um, and she learns that they're gonna, they're ready to start a family. Howard and his, his bride are gonna start a family. So she's gonna have grandchildren. So she says, I'm very proud indeed of my children that they face life so magnificently and have faith enough to plan for children. My heart's desire was six at least, but I've told you how physically wrecked I was by my Iroquois fire experience and how we had to give up having a large family. As I look back, I needed this disappointment and discipline for at one time in my life, my passion for children did a little constructed good in the world. All children became mine if they were abused or neglected and the detention home was built in consequence. One child opens the whole kingdom, and of course, I am a believer in adopting children if one can't have them. I'm not really sure, and we, we kept looking through letters to find out what is it about the Iroquois theater? Was it the fact that there's so many children that died? It, did it affect her so much that she lost her good friend Mary? And why can't she have children? I, none of that really flushed out in the end, but... Um, I, when I saw that connection to the Iroquois Theater file with that fire, we started doing the research and that's where the whole Frazier story comes in. So Kate did co-find, she was the co-founder of the Juvenile Protective Agency in Aurora. So she definitely, and you'll see later too, her love of children continues through her life. The Raftries travel quite often to Europe and they're listed as first class passengers most of the time, there they are. When their son Howard is very young, a nurse is usually listed alongside his name as being on board. In 1906, the Raftries take a voyage on board the steamship Minnehaha to visit Edmund's twin brother Alfred in London. Kate kept an illustrated journal of the voyage and their daily activities. The journal includes art clippings, photographs, and programs. So we have a lot of Kate's journals because of the Raftery family, and I just love how she incorporates I mean, this is, you know, very early on, she's incorporating images, she saves the menus, um, it's, they're, they're beautiful, and I've read all of them, <laughs> and it's really, it's better than a novel. So the Raftery family, this was very confusing, they have pet names for each other, Edmund was referred to as Dids, there he is on board. So he's going to be called Dids in all these letters I'm reading, and I'm like, who the heck's Dids? Well, we figured out later. Um, Kate is Mims, and Howard is Bids. But early on, we, we were like, who's she talking about? Does she mean does or dids? Or, and we find out she, th th these are their pet names. Um, and she writes her journals. Most of her journals are written to Bibbs, her son. And she'll say, dear Bibbs, today we did this. And then in one of them, she does say why she does it that way, because she wants him to have something when he's older to look back and read, even though he's on the trip with them, experiencing a little bit different than they are, but he, she wants him to be able to go back and look at it and read it like a letter to him, which it really was. It was they're beautiful. In this entry, Kate writes about the special bond that Edmund had with their son, Howard. Dids has just popped his head in to ask after you and was delighted to hear you were on deck. He has gone to find you, his own son, with whom he would rather be with than any other man on board. Chicklets you're gonna find in his pocket and Macintosh toffees too, not to speak of friendly lead pencils. And Howard loves to sketch and draw and a lot of his sketches appear in the journals. 
And I was going to share some because they're amazing. I'm figuring, I think he's like nine or something. And the sketches are incredible. Of course, he moves on to be a talented architect. Then this photograph that I think the Rafteries gave us really threw us off because, okay, obviously it appears to be a wedding. And there's Kate in a wedding dress. There's Edmund in a tux. And then on the back of the photograph, it lists all these names. A lot of them are cut off, but we started putting names together with people in Aurora that they were friends with from the golf club. This is Mr. Holbrook, Reverend Holbrook, who was the, the dad of Mary Fraser who died. And he's their pastor. So it looks like he's marrying them, right? But here's the weird part. Their son Howard's in the picture <laughs> and their, his friend Walter Frazier's in the picture. And of course they wouldn't have been there at the wedding. Well, it kept, we were so perplexed. We didn't know what to do with the picture and what, what is it? Well, one of her journal entries, she says on September 12th, 1909, it explains the celebration. Kate writes, Mr. Holbrook read a beautiful prayer and then did slipped on my finger the same silk glove I wore 15 years before, a beautiful sapphire and diamond ring. Her journal also includes many of the same names as at the back of the photograph and describes the dresses just as they are in the picture. So this was a wedding reenactment for their 15th wedding anniversary held in their Aurora home. Kate didn't do anything halfway, did she? <laughs> Quite a reenactment. In 1915, the Rathry family moved to Geneva, possibly to be near the train after a job change made by Edmund to begin work at a stove company in Chicago. They rent what was then known as the George Harris residence at 328 South 2nd Street. The Rafteries quickly become immersed into organizations in Geneva, and they host meetings, fundraisers, and parties. Here they hosted the eight o'clock card club at their home with guests including Dr. Blackman. And Dr. Blackman's a big uh, name in town, um, being a doctor right here on South 3rd Street with his wife. The Rafteries were members and very involved with St. Mark's Episcopal Church. They were the hosts for the old fashioned ice cream social on their lawn at Fulton and Second Streets. They've only been here for a little over a year and they're already hosting events for the community. Kate also becomes involved with the Geneva Women's Club and serves on their hospital committee in charge of entertainment for the white elephant sale to raise funds to furnish a room at Colonial Hospital, which is Geneva's first hospital just down the street. So she's very involved and uh, asked to help. And I thought this was neat. This was fun. I discovered this when I was researching Geneva's Christmas history. So Geneva's first community Christmas celebration took place in 1916 with a gathering around the Christmas tree and the West Side Schoolyard at South 3rd and James. So just kitty corner from here was that building um, on Christmas Eve. It was estimated that between 1,500 to 2,000 people showed for the lighting of the tree and singing of Christmas carols from the upper room of the high school and the music could be heard throughout town. Kate Raftery along with Mrs. Cook were given credit for the event and praise for their hard work. In the afternoon, Raftery and Cook took children carolers to visit people who were sick and to bring joy to the unfortunate ones. The first Christmas celebration was so successful that it was hoped to become an annual tradition and Kate continued serving on that committee for many years. But isn't that cool? She's part of the first, and we still do it today a little differently, but on Christmas walk, we celebrate very similarly. The Rafteries were praised for hosting one of the largest and most enjoyable card parties ever given in Geneva at their home. 80 ladies attended and played cards as a benefit for St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Kate was named chairman of the Junior Red Cross Auxiliary of the Fox River Chapter. She served on the canvassing committee to go from house to house to seek assistance. Just four, month late, four months later, she's named the chairman. During World War I, Kate was appointed as the official city chairman of Geneva Township Organization to assist the Council of National Defense with the Liberty Bond Campaign. Kate recruited other women in the community to join, the, join this committee, including popular names in Geneva's history, such as Bangs, Mead, Chrissy, Fauntleroy, Coltrap, McIntosh, Marstiller, Dow, Gridley, and Peck. So she knew how, who to get on her team to get the job done. 
Kate's love of children is evident throughout her life. She came up with the idea to have school children make calendars, pen and ink sketches just before Christmas time and take them to a vacant store in town to be sold. The proceeds would be given to the Fox River chapter of the Red Cross Society. She also organizes a high school unit for the Red Cross. She hosted meetings at her home for a children's garden committee where more than 80 students signed up to plant gardens. Eat local, meatless Mondays, go wheatless, more fruits and vegetables, less white sugar. Many of the things we hear a lot about today, Americans did during the First World War. The United States Food Administration campaigned to convince Americans to voluntarily change their eating habits in order to have enough food to feed our military and starving civilians in Europe. Kate Raftery's involvement in the local Parent Teacher Association included writing the Food Conservation Pageant, which was performed by Geneva school children in City Hall in the spring of 1918. The Chicago Red Cross secured the pageant as written by Geneva ladies, and it was staged in Chicago at the Pier, Ravinia, and other Chicago parks. Then Kate gets a letter from the United States Food Administration asking if it was copyrighted, and they wanted to have permission to use the pageant worldwide, or nationwide, I should say. The only request that they, that they made was that the phrase originally produced by the school children of Geneva, Illinois, placed on all the programs. I tried to find any of the programs, I couldn't. But um, I mean, how great is that? They didn't want their names to be on it, but they wanted Geneva and the, the children to be on the, on the program. So sometime in 1917-18, Edmund and Kate rent the cottage house that faces Fulton Street from Stella Buckingham, who owns the property at the time, and Stella lives in the house at 404 South Third. And then just about a year or so later in 1919, the Rafteries buy the entire property, including the carriage house, which you see on the right, and the original home at 404 South Third. There are several recollections in the museum archives about a private Montessori school starting in the home of Kate Raftery called the Little School. It is noted that this school later becomes known as the Adventure School and then Geneva's Country Day School. The philosophy of the school was that education must include physical preparation for life with a habit of logical thinking. And they said that Kate hosted that in the house. In 1919, Kate Raftery was elected to become a trustee for Colonial Hospital by the Hospital Board of Directors. That same year, her husband Edmund became president of the Geneva Golf Club. How, are, how do they have time to have all these parties? That's what I want to know. The Rafteries are very involved still with St. Mark's and Kate serves on the board of the Women's Guild and Edmund's their treasurer. In 1921, their Mad Hatter Tea Party was noted as one of the most novel social events ever given in Geneva. It was held on the lawn and in the homes of the Rafteries and surrounding neighbors' houses. It was designed as a chapter from Alice in Wonderland featuring Dorm Dormouse Inn, March Hare, and the Punch and Judy show. 10% of the proceeds went to the building fund of the Aurora Juvenile Home that Kate helped form. I want to go to that party. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Another fundraiser that Kate organized for, the, for her Juvenile Protective Association in Aurora was a put-away toy sale. These unique, unique toys were designed and handmade by Paul Chrissy of Geneva, and they were offered for sale in what is referenced here as in that unique little spot known as the Little House 404 South Third. So there's already references to her home as being the Little House or something little. And this is possibly what started Kate thinking about opening a full-time shop. And here it is, September of 1922, Kate Raftery officially opens up her shop in the home at 404 South Third. She displays items on that grand piano her father gave her for her birthday. This is the start of what soon after became known as the Little Traveler. And we do have her original sales book in the gallery that you can see her first um, a balance on hand was like 200 and something dollars on September 29th. And if you go to the very end of the page, which you won't be able to see, but it's like $5,000 balance on hand within like a year. So business was good. In the late 1920s, the Rafteries moved from their home at 404 South Third because the Little Traveler grew so much that they became crowded. 
They move to River Lane and Kate starts an initiative to clean up the riverfront and build attractive homes. Because at the time that was the dumping zone. So that area was not as pretty as it is today. It was pretty gross. So if Kate's gonna live there, she's gonna make sure it gets fixed up pretty. So her son Howard is an architect for her projects and she creates a real estate department at the Little Traveler. Her efforts received attention in the Chicago Daily News. And we, uh, Michael Lambert, who's the historic preservation planner in Geneva, will do a program uh, on this whole project uh, for us in May. And we'll offer that here and um, virtually as well. And he's done a lot of the research as to all the homes that she helped build. Edmund Raftery dies in March of 1939. Geneva Golf Club honors his memory by naming a silver bowl, the Raftery Cup. And each year names of the winners are engraved. He was also elected warden emeritus by St. Mark's Church. And I believe I asked my brother, Chuck, he was a golf club member. Is anyone a golf club member in the room? Uh, my brother was up until maybe five years ago, and he said that they were still doing the Raftery Cup. So I thought that's pretty cool. In 1940, Kate Raftery served as chairman of the Fox Valley British Relief Committee to collect articles for a decorator's British war relief shop in Chicago, sponsored by the American Institute of Decorators and the American Institute of Architects. Kate holds a lunch meeting at the Little Traveler to make the plans. The relief shop was located at 615 North Michigan Avenue and referenced as the Italian Court Building. Well, when I Google that address, this is what I get. I'm not sure if this is the exact building, but it does kind of look italian edge to me. I don't know, but that might've been where the headquarters were. All of the items that were donated by generous citizens um, were, um, they gave up their prized possessions to help the cause. Proceeds were turned over to the British War Relief Society for the purchase of field kitchens, hospital beds, and ambulances. Famous stars of stage and radio came out each afternoon to greet people. Radio star Lillian Gish was there on opening day, September 23, 1940. The Little Traveler sponsored, sponsored a day in October, and Kate donated a dozen antique Venetian silver plates from her collection. Over $3,000 was taken in during the first two hours that day. Pretty impressive. In 1942, Kate heads the committee to raise funds to equip the rest and recreation rooms at Camp Forest in Tennessee, where the Tennessee and Illinois National Guard were trained. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the camp became overcrowded with additional troops. The Illinois chapter of the American Institute of Decorators agreed to do the work at cost. A letter was written to Kate Raftery from the Institute of Decorators informing her that there are 125 barracks and at the end of each is a room supposedly for rest and recreation, but there are no government funds available for furnishing them. The goal was to raise $100 per room to supply chairs, desks, tables, curtains, and some unbreakable ashtrays, because you got to have those. And they asked, uh, in addition, they asked for extra radios, pianos, and games. So if you take a look at this, this is February. Here we are in April. Boom. Just two months later, it's announced Kate Raftery that $1,875 was donated from the Fox Valley, enough to furnish 18 of those recreation rooms. Each town of the Tri-Cities would have their name on a room. Among the organizations that contributed were the Geneva Women's Club and the American Legion. Two individuals from Geneva gave $100 each but wished to remain anonymous. I wonder who they were. And there are the guys who are so happy to be getting a piano. Now, this is kind of an interesting side story because we noticed that um, Kate and Edmund have several animals over the years. And we have pictures of Edmund holding cats and we see dogs and sometimes we see animals in the Little Traveler Almanac newsletter. So this story stumbled upon by chance. Now that the Geneva Republican online is searchable up to 1959, it's on the library's website. I could put Raftery in and get all kinds of hits. I could put Little Traveler in. It's only up to 1959 though. After that, it's not searchable until 2001, I think. So you, we have that span of time where we can't do research right now. We're hoping that they get those searchable. But so what did I get a hit on? An article that said that um, the story says in 1942, Kate had two Dalmatian dogs, one named Sammy Weller. And then later she purchases a companion for him and names him Dan Patch because of a big spot over his right eye. These images of Dalmatians we found in 
the stuff that you gave us. And we were like, wow. So the top left is a note card um, from uh, that was in the Raftery collection of a Dalmatian. It was just blank inside. Uh, in the middle of the photograph from the 1941 Little Traveler Almanac, and there's a Dalmatian at the feet of that woman. And then at the right, that's just another photograph from the collection. I don't know which dog it is. It doesn't really have a patch over its eyes, so maybe it's Sammy. Um, so anyway, I found an article that said Dan Patch, the, the new puppy she gets, was known to be a watchdog. And anyone who crossed the threshold of the Raftery home without the consent of Kate would be attacked. Dan Patch was trained by a well-known trainer in Barrington, and he was given a rating of 100% perfect in intelligence, physical condition, and good breeding. So what does Kate do? She decides to support the war efforts, and she gives Dan Patch to the Army for training in their dogs for victory with the Coast Guard. Pretty cool. And many of you know that during World War II, Kate sponsored the Rams, or Relieve a Man. Kate realized that with so many men in the armed forces, jobs such as mowing lawns, cutting hedges, washing windows, painting, and other odd jobs, they would suffer because of a shortage of labor. She arranged with a group of Geneva High School girls to organize RAMS, and it received national recognition. Pictures of the girls appeared in the Chicago Sun, and they were syndicated to appear in daily papers all over the country. The girls received so many fan letters from men in service, and some expressed a desire to spend their furloughs in Geneva if the girls <laughs> would show them around. <laughs> Kate had each girl registered with the United States Employment Service and requested permits from their parents and their school to do the work. Each girl was were given an identification card from the government, and Kate Raftery presented each of them with their red letters on white felt. And that's from our gallery. So I took that picture this morning because it's on display in our back gallery. Um, so it's kind of through a little plexiglass. That's not the best picture, but we have one of those little um, felt name tags that they wear. In 1950, Kate Raftery turned 80 years old. She was given this birthday card designed by artist William Lewis, who Kate hired in 1942 to create murals and artwork for the Little Traveler. They became close friends. The card reads, with fondest birthday wishes to the first Little Traveler from the happy family of Little Travelers. And it's signed by all of the Little Traveler employees. I was thrilled because my mom's on there. She was working for Kate at the time. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, the Chicago Tribune story tells about her birthday. <laughs> Whose 80th birthday gets written up in the Tribune? So this, I thought this was kind of fun. So Howard, Kate's son, had big plans to rope off the street and set up a street dance for Kate. And the celebration was then going to change to a large reception at the Little Traveler. Well, Howard says in this article, mother was afraid that friends might think they should bring presents and she wouldn't have any part of a large celebration. So the celebration ended up as a picnic in Island Park with Howard, his wife, Margaret, or Monty, and Kate's three grandchildren. So it went from a street dance to a picnic in Island Park. This article also adds that they helped their grandmother turn the first shovel of dirt for her future tree house at the site. And I'm like, tree house? There's no tree house in Island Park that I know of. Um, it says it was not up in a tree, but it was supposed to have a floating effect. I have no idea what that means. If anyone has any ideas, <laughs> maybe it never gets built. I don't know, but it says that her grandchildren helped her with the first uh, dirt. The following year on her 81st birthday, Kate has another quiet celebration at the home of her son. And the newspaper refers to her as the most widely known woman because of her little traveler shop. And I love this picture. This is from the Raftery collection. And we wonder if this is at her 80th birthday party in Island Park, because they're sitting outside on a bench. Um, not sure, but, and Kate does look like she's up there in years. So Kate Raftery dies peacefully on April 8th, 1953, at the age of 82, in her apartment on the second floor of Little Trev. She left behind her son, Howard, and three grandchildren, Kate Howard II, John Edmund, and Margaret Montgomery II. Her legacy of vibrant businesses on Geneva's historic Third Street continues today. She was recognized for her contributions to the community for encouraging others to open businesses, such as Robin's Bookshop, Mary and Michael's Children's Shop, and the Mill Race Inn, and for putting Geneva on the map with a little traveler shop. Here's some of the comments made about Kate in the press. She was the epitome 
of the 1890s, quiet and gracious, yet she lived and believed in the 1950s. She believed in all people, all races, all colors, all creeds, rich and poor alike. She was a bit of England transplanted. She was Paris too, and Fifth Avenue, New York. She brought and left a bit of each here in Geneva. And then these were quick shots that Heidi did for me quick this morning, because we were like, let's, let's tell people where, if, you know, if you wanted to go out to the cemetery, just make sure you got boots. I guess Heidi had to put her boots on. So Kate is buried in Geneva's Oak Hill Cemetery off Route 25. It's very hard to read her name in this picture. Um, the History Museum, well, I should say Heidi, is our, our educator, and she's doing a cemetery restoration project right now on Westside Cemetery at, at here of the Street. And I'm sure Oak Hill will be next someday after. <laughs> but when she came in with this picture today, she said we need to clean up Kate. So she learned how to clean these. Uh, stones yeah, so that you can read them better. So Kate is with Edmund and John Howard is out there as well as Margaret Montgomery, John's uh, Howard's wife. And then we noticed that um, your aunt, one of your aunts is out there, right? That'd be Kate Rosenthal. Yeah. So that's Kate the second in the picture prior. It was said, and this was actually a quote, in a paper, scores of top flight US writers sought to write the story of Kate Howard Raftery. For hers was the success saga of a socialite who without previous business training founded the little traveler shop of Geneva and built it into one of this country's most famous establishments. Yet each time someone sought the story of how she expanded that piano top into, little, into the little traveler, the tall, slim, patrician looking oct octogenarian would put them off with, write all you want about the business, but nothing about me, please. And that's who she was. Any questions? I feel like. My mom worked with Kate, so I tend to get a little emotional because it's like part of my story to it. Let me stop this share. And I'll, we'll, we'll take questions too, if you wanna chat on Zoom, if you wanna add, add any questions, Mark, you will help a question. I just wanna know, is it just not that I don't know, do you know about your grandfather? Your son, John Howard. My husband? No, no. it'll be John's dad, Howard no, Raftery. No, no, he, well, he was like 60. Yeah. We wondered that too. I don't think his obituary says that, you know, the cause of death. I'm not sure if do you know Mary? Was he sick? That's when he passed away, right? Because my husband was a freshman at the University of Wisconsin that year. But you don't know why. Well, um, let me think. I'm in a high, uh, massive heart attack at the dinner table. Oh, he was a diabetic, um, and often walking home from his office across the bridge, he'd stagger, and I think people thought that he had a drinking problem, but he didn't. <laughs> he probably was having a reaction and uh, needed to get home. But it was a, a heart attack. But. And what business was he in? He was an architect with Walter Frazier. Their office was right yeah. here where the olive mill is. Frazier and War was the name of the company. Any other? These John Howard's mix up. <laughs> <laughs> it is confusing because then there's also yeah there's. Uh, the middle names then also yeah, fill, because they all share passed around and then I went and did it too. I'm telling a cute story about the Dalmatians though. She okay. loved her dogs and it said that after their dinner they were allowed to lick the butter dish. <laughs> oh, I love that. Did any of you take part in the little traveler business after she was gone or at any time? No. No, I think when she passed away, um, Howard was involved in his own, in, in his prime with his firm. And uh, 
there wasn't anybody else to take over it, so they sold it to Mrs. Craft. Yeah. Craft Boots, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, she was related to Craft Boots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. And then they sold it to, I think it's Fred Harvey. Fred Harvey, uh -huh. Who had the oh, restaurants really? over the um, freeways. Yes. Also along railroads. Yeah. yeah. I just watched the Harvey Road. Oh, did you? Yeah. Judy Garland, right? Yeah. 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 And if you go in the, um, everyone's welcome to go into the gallery. It's free Tuesdays anyway. So, um, but the whole story is told inside of mostly Kate. We really focus on Kate starting right. the business because to us, it's she's she's the, the story. I mean, on from there, obviously, traditions continue, but uh, she's the main story that we focused on. And thanks to your family for sharing all of this, we were able to tell more of it. Oh, it was good motivation to go through, <laughs> you know, those boxes full of things that you're going to get to. Oh, yeah. It's relationship to Kate, again. She's granddaughter. Yeah. Granddaughter-in-law. So her husband was shown in that last that last picture of the grand grandchildren. Do you, Kate, you want to say anything? So I'm just so thrilled that we're still talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> My sister and brother, they live in the Carolinas, so it's convenient for me coming from Milwaukee, where I raised my family. And it's fun for me to represent, but we're just so thrilled that the little traveler's still here. We still drive by my mom's house that she grew up on. The school where she kissed my dad behind the tree when they were five. <laughs> Even though they shipped my dad away to boarding school. <laughs> Long time we've been together. He, he's passed. He's been gone about four years. And that's John Edmund Raftery. <laughs> circling back. But my brother's John Howard. <laughs> so, I mean, it's nice to see our names in print. Not all these stories. I need to cause more trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I got to try to do support the war. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to live up to it, Kate. I know, I'm <laughs> glad, but I have to say, goodness, but they are having fun going through photos and connecting dots. One of the funniest things going through there, we found about the dids and the bibs. <laughs> When her third child was born, for some reason, we always called him Dids. And we still call him Dids. His one name is really Patrick. His name is Patrick. And, and did you know that at the time? That we didn't know that at the No. I don't know even where it came from. Well, the travel log, the travel, the stories, and a lot of her. Yeah, I read but we didn't know, know that when we Patrick. started calling Dids. His name was Diddy. Diddy. Yeah. Yeah. Diddy. Called him Diddy for a while. P. Diddy. P. Diddy. P. Diddy. <laughs> That's a whole other Diddy. <laughs> okay, we have an online question. Um, this is from Mary, I'm so sorry, Elric. I think that's how you pronounce it. Although it is brick, so it could hardly be a tree house, the restroom pavilion in Island of Park appears to float on a concrete slab. Is there any information about when this was built? Dying. Well, that was a Wilson Brothers at the pavilion. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. a Wilson Brothers build. And I believe uh, Heidi, 1915-ish. Okay. So yeah, but that's a, I mean, good thought. Yeah. Helping us with that whole treehouse thing. What happened with the, um, the brother, his brother, actually brother in England, Missouri, did he come here? Do you have any contact? It, at Alfred, the twin? the twin? The twin. Yeah, he passes away before Edmund no, does. No, I keep thinking with ancestry. <laughs> I'm all Swedish, born and raised in Geneva, and, uh, Campbell and Six, and uh, so I thought I was 100% Swedish, and I found out now I'm 50, 50 Norwegian. <laughs> but, but I keep thinking, yeah, we have to go and check him out to see who's over there. Yeah, and make sure you write a journal about it. Yes. <laughs> Journal your trip. Anything else, Marky? Everybody else good? Well, thank you all for being here and for caring enough to uh, learn more. And I was fascinated. We're actually writing a book um, that the museum is going to sell. Hopefully, if, if after this, I, I'll get it done. And Kate was great to write. She uh, wrote the preface for it, and so did Mike Simon. So it's really going to be a wonderful book, Most, mostly pictures, because I think the pictures are fabulous. They're fascinating. 
with limited text, but the story about Little Traveler and uh, hope to have it by, I'm gonna say May. Who did, Carrie, who did uh, Michael Stad buy the uh, Traveler from? From Fred Harvey. Okay. That yeah. was the next owner. Maybe. Yeah, so there haven't been that many owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mike tells a great story about that whole purchase because his dad wasn't in the, the market for anything. He had all these shops here at the time. But uh, yeah, it's a fun story. All right, so I'm going to log off this, but everyone stay put for a second here. Um, let me end. Bye, everyone on virtual. Thank you.